Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. An upper room in Jerusalem on a Thursday evening some 2,000 years ago. If you were to pick an arena in which world-changing events would take place for the first time, you probably wouldn't have guessed a circumstance like that. And yet, you know how many remarkable things took place there on Maundy Thursday evening. You know how there in that upper room, the Lord and maker of us all got down on his hands and his knees in his undershirt and looked up at mere mortals, acting as if he were less than us, as if he had come to serve us, sinful human beings, which, of course, is exactly what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to do, not only to wash his disciples' feet and set an enduring example of Christian love and service, but even to lay down his life because he loves and honors us so much. You could step back and consider that this was the Passover meal that no one less great than Moses himself had put into play with great fireworks and events in Egypt long ago. But now on this Thursday evening, 12 Israelite guys got to sit around the table and eat the Passover meal with the Passover sacrifice that would end all sacrifices presiding at the head of the table. Remarkable, right? But of all the things that took place there on that Thursday evening, probably the one that we think about right away and most often is that it was there around that table that Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. That there he took the cup, gave thanks, and handed it to them, saying, Take and eat. Drink from it, all of you. When we think about the Lord's Supper, We usually talk about what it is and the blessings that it gives, and it's good that we do so. We need to be reminded and we need to review regularly that in this supper we receive Jesus' true body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. I'd like to point out tonight something that we perhaps don't often think as much about when it comes to the Lord's Supper. I'd like to point out that as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are making proclamation of Jesus' death and his coming again. You think about that. Of all of the events that took place on that Thursday evening, it was the Lord's Supper that ever since, without any breaks and all around the world, has been celebrated by Christians. I think about... I can't really think about anything else in this world that has so caught on and stuck, so to speak, as the Lord's Supper, the meal where past and future meet, the meal that ties us to all of those Christians who have gone before us, that literally makes us all share one blood, and the meal that unites us to all those Christians who are going to come after us. That we in our present moment are are right here between the two. And that we, as we eat the bread and drink the cup, the Apostle Paul tells us, that we are the ones who are proclaiming the Lord's death. Think about that. You come forward and you gather around this altar and the pastor comes with that little wafer and that tiny sip of wine. And here you are, Making proclamation to all the world of what? Well, of Jesus' death. Well, how does that happen? How does our celebration of the Lord's Supper do this great thing? Certainly there are words that we hear surrounding the Lord's Supper that point us back to Jesus' death. The ones that I think about right away are are the opening words of the words of institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed. Perhaps you've noticed that there are some times here in church when those words seem almost out of place. 
On Christmas morning, for example, as we celebrate Jesus' birth, suddenly we arrive at the Lord's Supper and there we are back on Monday, Thursday evening. Or come to our Easter sunrise service, certainly of all of the days of the year, the day when we are not focused on Jesus' death but on his resurrection, and yet we celebrate the Lord's Supper and the words of institution remind us that there in that upper room on Thursday evening, all was not well. That besides Jesus and the disciples, Satan was there too, filling Judas's heart and sending him off into the darkness to carry out his deadly errand. Every time we hear those words of institution, we're reminded of this, that, that there in the upper room was the beginning of the end. That after Jesus and his disciples left, he went out to the garden, he was arrested, and his suffering began, and it would not come to an end until he was stone-cold dead, and Joseph of Arimathea was begging off his body to lay it in his tomb. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're remembering the events of Monday, Thursday evening, yes, but, but certainly there's more that proclaims the Lord's death here. As the pastor comes to you with bread and wine, what does he say? He says, take and eat the body of Christ given into death. He says, take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And as you receive his true body and blood, how can you not think about Jesus' death? If Jesus hadn't died, why would we be doing this? If Jesus' death wasn't something so important that it'd be worth proclaiming, why would we be coming forward and week in and week out be reminded that it was his body which bore our sins and carried them to the cross? And that it was his blood which he poured out to wash us from all of our sins and make us pure and spotless and holy. You come forward to receive his body and blood because you believe that this is so, because you believe that the body and blood you receive here are the very body and blood of Jesus who gave his life for the sins of the world, who died for you. You come forward and receive his body and blood because you believe that this is the place where his death and your forgiveness meet. Where Jesus hands to you everything that he won by his suffering and death on the cross. If you don't believe that this is so, then you have no place at this altar. But if you do, then you come forward with that mix of sorrow over sin and joy at forgiveness that we call repentance. You come forward with humility. You know that you need a Savior. You come forward with confidence because you know that you have a Savior. Jesus Christ, who that night was betrayed and who the next day was crucified and died. You come forward to receive the Lord's Supper because you believe that Jesus died for you. And so as you do so, you proclaim the Lord's death. Just like Paul said. Think about this. All of the things that you do in life, all of the actions that you take, they all reveal something about you. If you're a baseball fan, maybe you wear a Brewers shirt, You hop in the car, you drive over to Milwaukee, and you catch a Brewers game. And anybody who sees you, anybody who knows that that's what you're doing, is going to learn about you, that learn that baseball is something that you enjoy. If you're not into baseball, you won't make the effort to drive over to Milwaukee and catch the game. What does it say about you and me if we make the effort to come to the Lord's Supper? Does it not say that we have found here our pearl of great price, our dearest treasure, firm ground on which to take our stand, that we value so highly the gifts that Jesus gives us as he gives us his body and blood.
for the forgiveness of sins. You know what that means? It means this, that even those who gather with us and don't come to commune, even they benefit from what they see taking place as we go through and receive Christ's body and blood. Little kids who sit out in the pews or who take mommy's hand and come forward with her, what do they learn? Well, in watching mommy, they learn this, that mommy believes that something important is taking place here, that mommy treasures Christ's body and blood, that this Jesus gave his body into death and shed his blood, and that that matters and that it gives us peace and comfort and joy. Anybody who comes here and sees us celebrating the Lord's Supper should learn that this is a church where we treasure the true gospel, where Jesus Christ crucified for the sins of the world is the main message, our central focus. You know, even someone with no background in Christianity could watch us going through the reception of the Lord's Supper, and they would at least know this, that we think something very special is taking place here and that, that this takes place around this Jesus who died. Why is that? It's because as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. I don't know how often we think about it in those terms. I fear that we think like we think about everything in life, that the Lord's Supper is something that's rather personal and almost private. That we come forward to have a special moment with Jesus, and yes, we're shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters, but it's mostly about him and me. If that's the case, if we haven't thought all that much about how the Lord's Supper proclaims Christ's death, and I'm sure that we haven't given thought to the fact that the Lord's Supper also proclaims the fact that Christ is going to come again. Though that is exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, it's that certainty that you can trust Christ, that his promises are sure, it's that certainty that he means it when he says he is going to come back that's kept Christians coming to his Lord's Supper for the last two millennia. Jesus in the upper room on that Thursday evening knew that the time he had with his disciples was coming to an end. Yes, he would see them again after his resurrection, but it wouldn't be the same. They wouldn't be living together, walking together. They would see each other for only the briefest moments and encounters. And yet even there, Jesus gave them the promise that they would see him again. He said he would not drink this fruit of the vine until he drank it with them anew in his Father's kingdom. And his disciples heard that. Later on, when Jesus ascended before their eyes, they were told that he would return in the very same way that he was taken from them. And Jesus' disciples heard that and they believed it. Because they believed Jesus. Because they believed that he was going to return and deliver them to an eternity of joy. Because they believed Jesus, they celebrated and continued to celebrate that great meal that he left. His last will and testament. And isn't it because you and I believe that as well, that we come to the Lord's Supper and we continue to celebrate it? Because you and I believe that there is more to this world than meets the eye. That we have more to look forward to than the end of our biological crawl. What do we proclaim when we come to the Lord's Supper but that Christ's promises are sure and certain. And that the day is coming when we are going to sit down to feast with him in the Father's kingdom just as he said. As you come forward, 
Say your mealtime prayers. Come, Lord Jesus. And think about this. The Lord's Supper is going to continue to be celebrated by Christians until that glorious day comes when Jesus returns and brings an end to this age and ushers us into the eternal glory that his death won for us. Friends, how could we ever proclaim Christ's death without also proclaiming his resurrection, his ascension, and his return? It gives us a lot to think about as we receive his body and blood this evening, doesn't it? We can come forward with confidence. We come here to to make our stand, to make a statement, or better, to make our proclamation. That we stand in that line, that unbroken line of countless Christians who in countless places around countless altars have celebrated the Lord's Supper. And we, in our present moment, will take up our work of proclaiming both the past and the future. We come forward and it puts us in the right frame of time between those, the only two events that really matter, one in the past and one yet to come. We come forward and we do as Paul said. We proclaim his death until he comes. With that in mind, we come forward with joy and confidence. Here is the place where our Savior Jesus meets us. Here is the place where he gives us the forgiveness of sins, one on the cross. Here is the place where he strengthens us, God's pilgrim people, to carry on our pilgrimage until the day of his return.